So I wanted to open this talk by saying I'm a technologist. Uh, psychological safety isn't a specialty area of mine. And I want to be clear during this talk that you don't need experts to enact change, to create better cultures in your organization. So I am a team leader as well. Though again, I, I think it's worth making clear, this all started very much as a bottom-up change. Uh, you don't need positional authority for anything I'm going to talk about today. And there will certainly be experts on the subject listening to this talk. Uh, this is just a perspective on how we've attempted to operationalize behavior change at GSK. So psychological safety is, is likely a term that a lot of you have heard over the past 12 months or more. Um, it is becoming a new buzzword and it's getting more and more popular. I would, I would urge you not to worry about the term. It is, is a great term, but really what we're talking about here is high performing teams or high performing cultures. And psychological safety is, is a very neat bow to wrap a number of concepts up that, that are important when you're talking about these. And I'll give you some background today on what it is and why it's important and some actions that we can all take responsibility for creating it. And we'll talk about how we as a team turned talking into action. And I'll also cover a, a pilot program that we're going through at GSK at the moment to embed the practice of psychological safety into the wider organization. So this is from Daniel Coyle and the Culture Code. And I want you to think about the most connected team you've ever been on, the most cohesive team. And, and that could be a team from school. It could be sports. It might be a family group. It, it could easily be work. And I want you to, to think about that feeling, you know, what it feels like to be on a team that's cooperative, that's cohesive and, and connected. What was that worth? You know, how much did it add to performance? How much does it raise the game? And, and we've all heard that famous phrase, you know, a group is more than the sum of its parts, but, but how much more? And there was, a, there was a Harvard team that looked at this and they compared teams that were essentially the same apart from one of those focusing on culture and the, the aspects of culture within the group. Some had strong, some had weak cultures. But what they found was the difference in performance measured over a 10 year period was 756% on net revenue growth and stock price was even higher at 901%. This is, is why we're talking about psychological safety. A good culture is performance and an organization that focuses on shaping their culture generates massively more revenue growth than those that don't. For us at GSK, that's about doing more, feeling better, and living longer. Each organization has its purpose and connecting to that purpose is so much easier if you have a solid culture behind that. The question is, of course, what makes up that space? So what's the difference between an average team and 756%? And psychological safety gives us a new way of talking about the space and focusing in on that gap. So ultimately, it's the key to unlocking a high performing culture. Now, this is the traditional way to think about this stuff. And, and people talk about it as being the soft stuff or it being a quality that groups have, it's embedded in them. And if we try to represent, it would, it would look something like this. Um, you'll recognize some of these from your own corporate values. GSKs are certainly in here. How do you get better at culture? Well, you do some of this stuff. How do you get higher performance? You do some of this stuff. And of course, we need teamwork. We need values. We need integrity. We need cohesion. We need passion. We need all, all of these things. You won't be surprised to know that Enron values are also in here at the point where they had all of their troubles. Boeing's values are in here at the point where they had the issues with the 737 MAX. Having the words is, is not enough. None of them are actionable. They have to be more than just slogans on the wall. 
And psychological safety takes a few of the key things in here and operationalizes them. It makes them actionable. Now, I'd like to jump to the, the uh, definition of, of psychological safety. And, and this is from a paper in 1999 by Amy Edmondson. Um, and I love the, the, the phrasing in this, you know, not be punished or humiliated for speaking up. And, and if we think about examples, you know, saying, I don't know, or I screwed that up, or I need to understand this, or I don't know how to get us there, I need help. They're all superb examples in this space. And we can't really talk about psychological safety without talking about these two. So on the left, as you can probably imagine, is, is Amy Edmondson. And we've, we've just seen the, the definition from that paper where she raised the term and popularized the term, where she was measuring 51 teams in manufacturing. But before that, she was looking at studies around performance in hospitals. And she's got a great TED talk that, that gives a summary on this. And she was looking for evidence that high performing teams make less mistakes. So it was a long study, multiple hospitals, levels of team and she found the results when she started analyzing them were the exact opposite of what she expected she found that the most cohesive teams reported more errors she went back into the hospitals to do a little more analysis and she found the teams were talking about errors more so she posited at the time you know maybe the better teams aren't actually making more mistakes they're just more willing to openly discuss them there's an environment there where they can talk about them jump over to the right here and this is um, a study by google called project aristotle from 2012 and again they were looking to see what makes a, an effective team and they looked at about 170 teams across engineering and sales a mix of high and low performing teams. And what they found was that high performing teams were less about the individuals on the team and more about how the team worked together. So individual high performers were not necessarily an indicator of performance. It was how the team cohesively worked together. And what they found was this golden thread that was psychological safety. And it was by far and away the most important factor to high performance in those teams. I love this from, from Amy Edmondson. So I want you to think of a moment in your career where you held back an idea, a, a question or a concern. And it has to be a, a moment where it was actionable or feasible, but you held back. It could be in a team meeting, a one-to-one, -one, an all hands. The only limitation is that it happened at work. Now you might have felt your silence didn't matter much. Or you might think it was really important, but you still held back. Now, what are the what are the implications of this? And it happens frequently. You know, most people are not 100% certain that what they had to say was valuable. There are a lot of grey areas in our day to day. And who gains if you open your mouth? Well, others do. You know, clients, business, patients, customers. When will that gain happen? Well, probably later. And how confident are you that you speaking up, that, will it, that game will happen? And, you know, that was a gray area. You're not really confident. Now, if we consider the alternative, you know, who gains if I say nothing? Well, I do. I remain safe for just one more moment. And when will that game happen? <laughs> Straight away, now. And how confident am I that that game will occur? And it might be tiny, but of course, it's 100% confidence. And we learn this at a very early age. We're not born with it, but for most of us, this starts in school even. You know, an idea being called out as silly, a question being ridiculed. And this asymmetry is, is built into how we operate, you know, especially in hierarchies. And as Amy highlights, it's a surprise anyone speaks up at all. But nobody gets up in the morning and comes to work to look stupid or inept. And the good news is we've developed strategies through our life. We do it effortlessly and it's called impression management. We learn this throughout our lives, but we become risk managers and we over manage personal risk and under manage business risk. And when 
we're in the workplace, if impression management is our primary concern, innovation and outcomes suffer. It's never going to go away. We always care about what people think about us, but we don't want it to be the first thing we think about when we're considering raising a concern or a question. A psychologically safe environment gives us permission to be candid. So it is worth saying that psychological safety is not the goal here. You know, the topic really is about lowering the threshold to a point where it's safe to be candid, not putting it at zero, but putting it significantly below where it traditionally sits. And this is not going to be comfortable for people. You know, this will be most uncomfortable for any managers who don't already have some of the practices we'll talk about in this talk as standard. And, and, and Amy highlights kind of three steps, three things that you can do in order to try and maximize uh, the psychological safety within an environment. So one is frame the work. You know, we are trained to see things framed by our own histories, our own biases, our preferences. And we're largely, largely not consciously paying attention to these things. And we are in a VUCA world, you know, there's, there's a great deal of volatility, uncertainty, complexity and, and ambiguousness. And we haven't been here before. So if we frame things as learning problems, not as execution problems, highlight that we have uncertainty and we need all brains at the table. So framing the work, super important. Secondly, invite engagement and acknowledge our own fallibility in that as well. Being clear, I may miss something or I'm finding this complex, I need help. Getting engagement and, and bringing voices to the table is, is super important. And then thirdly, respond productively and, and model curiosity. You know, the, the best way to get voices there is to respond in a positive light, ask questions, get people engaged. So if nothing else, start there. But there is so much more you can do and you don't need a title and you certainly don't need to have positional power. So when we're working with teams on this, um, make sure that you're explicit in any talks that all of this on the slide is expected. You are giving permission for candor. You are giving permission for failure. Um, there's a permission for challenge. And, and more than that, actually, you are inviting it. And this is not easy. You know, these bits at the top become part of the, the language around psychological safety. Amy Edmondson would talk about it as interpersonal risk. You have to take that first step. Um, it requires you to get a little uncomfortable, but the, the outcomes are what we care about here. This is about improving culture and improving performance. The leaders within an organization have a massively outsized role to play in this as well. They can amplify behaviors and make it safe, but we all do need to take responsibility and accountability for this. This is very much a we problem and change will only happen if it happens with you. So expecting an environment like this to be handed to you will unfortunately make no change. So, as I said, you know, this doesn't need experts and it doesn't need consent. You know, we, we started this conversation at team level nearly 18 months ago, started locally. We read some books around high performance cultures. Um, we looked at what high performance was, blog posts, things like that. We looked at Google Project Aristotle and we, we went on that learning journey together. We measured our team and we'll talk about the measurement aspect of this later to understand we were, how psychologically safe a team we were and what our opportunities were to improve. And we tried to make it part of the everyday conversation. Jump forward and, and we now measure our team every quarter and we try to make at least some tangible improvement each quarter. We always have a goal on improving some aspect of our psychological safety. So it's, it's certainly a journey, not a destination. Now, within GSK, we use um, Facebook Workplace. So we shared our story. We talked about culture and high performance. We shared our psychological safety results. You know, we wanted to start a conversation. Um, leadership very much uh, championed this as well in, in kind of like an up and out sort of pattern. And we took as many opportunities as we could to engage and discuss on this. 
And, and interest really grew from there across the org. We had so many people talking about their local needs and how they felt psychological safety could really help them address some challenges they were seeing locally. But every organization has teams like ours, you know, people interested in culture and wanting to put in place actions to help improve it. And psychological safety is just a perfect vehicle to have that conversation. So this is the model that I, I'll talk about now. This is the model that we've used as a team, but it's also the one that we're using as we, we embed this elsewhere in the organization. And these four steps are key. Um, we are starting small at the moment, so we're rolling out to about 250 people within the pharmaceuticals part of our business. And we're identifying champions and, and interested partner, like parties internally to help embed this wider. So the more people we can have championing, both both at the grassroots level and at the leadership level, the more chances we have of success. It's worth being clear, this hasn't cost a penny yet. Um, people think enterprise and they think consultants, advisors and cost. It doesn't have to be like that. You just need people internally interested in that journey of, of this kind of ongoing improvement and being willing to run with it. So let's let's look at the four steps. Building up knowledge is key uh, before we go anywhere near measuring our psychological safety. And the focus during this phase is really about maximizing that awareness for everybody. Uh, you want everybody to have as much context as possible. And during this first quarter, it, there's a lot in here about amplifying the discussion. So teams taking these discussions away and talking about what it means to them locally. Um, I'll, there's a book list later on as well. I would consider reading a number of books in this phase. You may also, depending on your organization, you may spend some extra time with leaders. As I said, leaders have a, a significantly outsized role here. So maximizing their knowledge can potentially maximize the impact of psychological safety behaviors landing. And then we get into measurements. So how do you know if you are psychologically safe? How do you know if you have it in place? How do you know if you're improving? And these seven questions on the left here are from a, a questionnaire from Amy Edmondson. Each of them are a seven part Likert scale. So from strongly disagree to strongly agree, we make sure it's anonymous. Um, it's important to get honest answers here. So anonymity is, is really important. And it's worth stating, this is not about finding the people who think we're not psychologically safe. It's about starting a conversation around improvement and, and understanding where we are now and what we need to do to get better. And this server is the key starting point on that, really. You know, we can't improve if we don't know what the problem is. So once we have the results from the survey, uh, we need to understand them and, and understand where the opportunities are to improve our culture by making psychological safety this kind of core set of behaviors. Um, we always get leaders to review these first. Um, they look for any obvious pain points, but there's a key thing here about talking to the teams as well, making sure you bring them into the conversation. Um, being transparent, you know, sharing the results, sharing the discussion and at the top left here, you can see these are both the same question, which is around being people being able to bring up problems and tough issues. The results on the left, fairly healthy, not, not a bad set of answers at all. The results to the right there, there's a little more towards uh, kind of disagreement. So there's there's an opportunity there for a discussion around improvement. And then this is going to be an ongoing journey. So during the period where you are trying to embed this, this change, and for us, it's a quarter, um, just making it part of like a core part of the culture. We want to be able to say, I screwed this up or I don't know or I need help without it being held against us. So we'll keep comms going during the quarter with the team. We'll make this cycle quarterly. We need to know if we're improving, but we're tying the behavior change in as a golden thread, really. So we jump back to that early figure. Uh, you know, companies that focus on shaping their culture will generate 756% more net revenue over 10 years than one who doesn't. Now, in our small team, we've been doing this for 18 months, as I said. Not every quarter is an improvement. You know, you don't always win. 
but you are focusing on creating the best culture you can do and you are ensuring that you invest in a better future through action. Um, we've time and again seen wins as a team. Our team connected with each other, you know, they care about each other and they have fun together, but they very much also problem solve together and they demonstrate vulnerability, they bring ideas and they innovate with low ego, they challenge each other, they debate. Now, in the, the further embedding into the org, we're a little too early in the journey um, for that to understand the wider impact. And I suspect, like our own team, it will probably take two to three quarters to really land fully. Now, for GSK from January, we're ramping that up to about 2,000 people across a wider part of our pharmaceuticals business. And the hope is that this picks up momentum and rolls out to all parts of the org. So as I said, there's a quick reading list there. Uh, Fear, Fearless Organization, super powerful, but the rest of these books are really useful as well. Thank you.